Welcome everyone to a new edition of Mercer Investments Live on LinkedIn. I'm joined today by two Mercer executives, Cara Williams and Rich Newsom. Cara is the global head of ESG and sustainability, and Rich Newsom is the global chief investments strategist for Mercer. The year has gotten off to a great start. We've recently come out of the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland. And this is a great opportunity to catch up with both of you. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. So I'd love to just kick things off with you, Rich. Um, climate change continues to be front and center at Davos. What were your top one to two areas that you heard discussed as most critical addressed and why? So the two most critical areas, one is um, further incentivization for green tech and clean tech, green tech and clean tech innovation. So disruptive technology investment to reduce the cost of renewable power generation, transmission, storage, and otherwise impact carbon emissions in the economy. And the other, which is somewhat related, but kind of at the other end of the value chain is massive infrastructure investment needed in developing economies and how to de-risk that for investors. In many cases, renewable energy is already cheaper as a source of energy but we need to put money in the ground in terms of new property plant and equipment to either generate store or transmit that power and in the in the developing economies there's a challenge with that because these are long-term investments and many of these economies don't have an investment grade sovereign debt rating so if you wouldn't invest in the government of the country you know would you feel safe making infrastructure investment there and there's promising developments on on both those fronts disruptive technology investment and massive infrastructure investments Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rich. And Cara, there's been a lot of media attention given to two areas of policy development, specifically around ESG. Would appreciate your thoughts on um, the apparent politicization of ESG debate in the United States and also the European government's reaction to the green energy components of the Inflation Reduction Act in the USA. Super. Thanks very much, Danielle. I mean, both both um, pretty meaty topics. You know, I think on the first one and politicization of ESG. Unfortunately, um, you know, I think ESG has come to mean uh, by you know, sort of broader population to mean something that it really isn't. Um, and what ESG is is you know taking all available information when making investment decisions, um, and that includes environmental, social, and governance issues. How well is a company you know, governed um, across all of those issues, but also whether or not there are regulations in place that are potentially going to hurt or benefit um, a, a corporation's uh, operations. So ESG investing uh, by virtue of what it is it's not about exclusions. Um, it's not about you know, uh, blanket um, deciding that you're not going to be investing into certain areas. Uh, it, again, it, for us, it's really about good investment acumen and incorporating all available information, and that's really what ESG is. The um, the Inflation Reduction Act is an interesting area. You know, I think you know, we all know Biden's administration is uh, trying to very proactively address the impact of climate change, and by doing so has come up with a way to, you know, you know, and I, even Rich has just referred to the, the, the future is in green tech um, and the, the way that you're going to be able to uh, see the fastest change and the most impactful changes by a green tech. And the IRA actually addresses that. Um, the Europe, basically the, the European Union, the most loud would be probably Germany and the UK, have taken issue with it in that um, while they are absolute proponents of the fact that the United States government now is, is really accepting and understanding the risks of climate change, and most importantly, are in a position now to actually address climate change, given you know, the US's position as, a, um, as a, an emitter. Um, but the part of the issue is around protectionism, and I think there's a general concern in the EU, um, you know, particularly by Chancellor Schultz in Germany, saying that um, you know it, it, this are, there is a significant risk of lack of innovation, and um, by virtue of this new protectionism that could come about through the IRA. So there are um, you know there are effectively nine areas where where they're they've flagged concern, but the U.S. is at the table and discussing through these. And like I said, in in, in the end, Europe is is, is thrilled to see this shift in um, in approach towards climate. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Karan. If I can maybe just add a, a slight deviate question onto that is, 
So what is your perspective then of private markets and why is this asset class advantage to integrate ESG? Yeah, so private markets is going to be the most impactful area that you can actually invest, right? You're going to have to decide what you want to impact and how you want to go after it, given the fact that there are lots of potential opportunities within environment alone, um, but also even with it within social aspects. And again, to you know, to refer to, to Rich's comments about green tech and clean tech and, and disruptive te disruptive technologies. All of these firms are effectively in the nascent stages, all seeking, um, you know, seeking capital. So you do see really active amount of movement um, in this space, and there's a you know, potential significant um, upside to investing with a lot of these firms. There's also significant risk in the fact that you know you do have a lot of players. A lot of these will not have been necessarily seasoned as as business management um, on the business management side, but a lot of the technologies are incredibly the sort of game changing for for where the, the world is going to be able to go and ultimately very profitable for, for investors who understand what they're investing in. And again, if they really understand where they want to make an impact and, and keep their focus on, um, on impacting those areas specifically. Thank you so much, Cara. Um, Rich, maybe over to you, uh, a two-part question. What did you hear that gives you hope that we are making progress when it comes to climate change, change investing? And are there any specific areas of innovation or new technology, for instance? So, Danielle, technology is inherently unpredictable. We had the fracking innovation a few years ago and emissions actually went down. That, that wasn't a uh, technologically improvement that was necessarily targeted by, by green tech or clean tech, but it, it helped in, in, in the short term. Um, the two, having said that, the two innovations I heard a lot about at Davos that I'm excited about, one is direct air capture and the other is green hydrogen. And, and let me put it in context. Um, there's parts of the economy where we emit CARMID, and so it'd be great if we could take carbon back out of the atmosphere. When you move to renewable energy in your power grid, you don't really control when the sun shines, when the wind blows, when the water flows in the river. And so you can end up, and you do end up, you tend to end up with excess energy at points of time, and you either need to store that energy or it gets wasted that potentially wasted energy can be used to power direct air capture and take carbon back out of the atmosphere at points in time when we have surplus renewable energy. Similarly, there's been a lot of focus on, on improving battery technology to store excess energy and, and have it available for use when there's peak power demand, but the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining, maybe there's a drought, and, and so renewables aren't, aren't producing energy. Battery technology is, is chemicals intensive. It's, it's relatively short term in terms of life of the batteries, whereas there's a huge market for hydrogen globally that exists. There's a small amount of green hydrogen produced today, meaning hydrogen is produced with purely green energy. We could produce a lot more green hydrogen. There's existing demand for hydrogen even before you get to new applications. And, and so, um, and that, that's a long term form of storage. That's not a form of storage that degrades with time or is is chemicals intensive or you know rare earths intensive so i think i think those two things is ways to use excess renewable energy when we have it either either use it to take carbon directly out of the atmosphere in the case of direct air capture or store it for the long term or or for pre-existing economic uses that are already made of hydrogen you know th those are those are some great innovations at the margin but but just the general wave of innovation gave me optimism those are just two specific examples that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rich. Um, maybe back over to you, Cara, to wrap up today's conversation. What specific takeaways or one to two concrete steps can institutional investors take to drive global climate action today? So, you know, again, I think climate change is, is such a vast area um, and certainly a vast area of opportunity. And the most important thing for any investor, regardless of it, you know, if it's institutional or just a large investor, is to identify what areas they are looking to make the greatest change. You know, Rich has, has touched on some really interesting innovations, um, you know, and I think the, the greatest risk that you can find somebody making as an investor, and this would really adhere to any asset class, really, is is the fact that they become too concentrated in one area or that they're so thinly diversified that they actually aren't going to be able to make the impact they need. You know, I, I think to have a very concerted and well thought through investment process on what they're looking to achieve in this space, um, you know, if, if you are large enough to make 
you know, the individual allocations and direct investments, um, then that's that's a great way to do it. But otherwise, you know, I think the vast majority of investors are probably best served in um, you know working with a professional who's going to make a, a broad um, number of investments across a number of areas in in green tech and broader climate change um, mitigation. So that my 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 default is always um, you know stick with the pros if you can't do it uh, you know and if, if unless you are truly confident that you have the um, the insight and the access to transparency and uh, tech, tech know-how um, to be able to make those investments yourself. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We've covered so much today about the role that investors can play in the topic of climate change and its economic realities. Um, as a part of our closing remarks, we'd love to hear from both of you anything that hasn't been covered that you think is critical for the audience to know or something that you want to make sure is put out there as we head into 2023. Danielle, take us back for a second to the question you asked, Kara, about politicization of ESG in the U.S. and the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're learning over and over again that ESG is not one size fits all. If I sit with 14 different investors, as I did recently, I'll hear 15 different passionate takes on ESG in terms of objectives and implementation and everything else. So it's not one size fits all. A growing proportion of institutional investors believe that there's a risk return thesis around ESG and the Inflation Reduction Act and the um, competition we now see between the US and, and the UK and the EU on who can have the best industrial policy to create the green champions of the future. You know, that that kind of policy shift goes to Kara's comment about if regulations are changing, if the environment's changing, that, that's government policy, but consumer demand is shifting. We've recently seen um, Electronic vehicle sales globally go go above 10% uh, of, of new vehicles sold. So consumer preferences are changing, government preferences are changing. There's a real risk return thesis around ESG that many of our clients are embracing, but we also have clients that are values based and and just look at the world and say we're gonna we're gonna have a positive impact with our investments and we're not gonna have a negative one. And that that's fine too. It's a different approach, and I think part of the reason for the politicization in the U.S. is. We, we have some fiduciaries and other stakeholders saying, hey, you told us this was about risk and return. When we hear you talk about it, it sounds like it's values based. Which is it? Because if I'm sitting on a not for profit hospital board and endowment board, I can do values based. But when I'm a pension plan, I need to be sole interest of beneficiaries. I'm on board with the risk return thesis, maybe, but not not the values based. So I think that'll get sorted out over time and, and we'll have, you know, again, not one size fits all approaches, but all moving in the same direction of um, of, of changing the way that we produce and consume energy so that we, we can uh, stick with a sustainable level of temperature increase. Yeah, I mean, I would add in, you know, I, I think in in general, over the last couple of years, we're seeing a normalization um, of, of, a, of understanding of climate change and its in, impact. Um, a lot more corporates now are, are being asked by analysts at their at their earnings reports um, to explain and highlight what steps they're making um, in order to you know, mitigate the impacts they have on the climate, but also to to become a more sustainable organization. Um, and I think that that's a great a, a great shift because as soon as you've got the buy side analysts asking these questions, it, obviously corporates are going to start to sit up and actually have to be able to answer these questions um, in a truly authentic way. So there's a lot of positivity and, and movement that we see happening that is really only going to ultimately help us get not sure if we'll get down to the one and a half degree um but maybe a two degree uh increased world um but um you know I, I think all in all i'm i'm certainly optimistic and i know there's always skeptics about you know what what's the what what's the corporate world or governments you know what are they actually doing but you know, you hear more and more about blended finance and there's a general general and true genuine desire to come up with solutions to to make things um feasible and start to move at least some of the investment opportunities from global north down to global south so um all in all i mean i'd say you the last couple of years are really positive and you know I, my expectation is to continue to see more of this as an investment opportunity as well i, I want to link to and amplify kara's comments but with with a focus on a different stakeholder group kara's absolutely right about buy side analysts asking questions of management teams when i meet with operating companies even government-owned companies in, in developed markets, they increasingly feel they need to have a credible ESG plan, not just because it impacts their cost of capital, if they're raising equity or debt capital from global capital markets, but they wanna participate in global supply chains. And if that supply chain ends up with sales of goods in Europe, 
even without the carbon border tax, you know, European consumers prefer green. If it ends up with sale of goods in North America and Japan and South Korea, you know, to participate in the global supply chain of a, of a global multinational that needs a credible ESG plan for the reasons Car identified, the, these, these small local producers to participate in that supply chain, they're, they're putting together and, and sincerely implementing credible ESG plans without any local regulation and without any local shareholder pressure just to participate in the global economy. And I think that's hugely bullish as kind of an invisible hand element moving things even in the absence of direct regulation or direct shareholder pressure. Fantastic. Well, thank you both Cara and Rich for joining us today on Mercer Investments Live. Um, as we wrap up the show, I encourage everyone in the audience, if you're not already following Rich Newsom and Cara Williams, please encourage you to do so on LinkedIn. Also encourage you to follow Mercer Investments on LinkedIn for upcoming news, insights, thought leadership, and events for our global investments community. And for those of you who have left comments or questions, we will absolutely be following up with all of those after today's event.